Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Steve, AMD just released the third gen Threadripper 3960X and 3970X, and I need to know which $450 plus motherboard to buy. Well, don't worry, I've got you covered. But before we get too far into it, Today's video is sponsored by PC Case Gear, Australia's premier online PC store. Whenever I'm in the need for a product, they're the first place I turn to, and I've been a customer of theirs for years now, so I really can attest to the quality of their service. I value their broad product range, competitive pricing, customer support, and easy to navigate website. With two decades of experience, I know I can trust PC Case Gear to look after you guys as well as they look after me. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so I realize most of you probably don't care about VRM thermal performance of extreme high-end motherboards supporting a platform where the cheapest CPU costs $1,400 US. But I do have eight TRX40 motherboards. So yeah, of course I'm gonna test them all out. But before we jump into the results, a quick look at the VRM configuration and cooling for each board. The ASUS Prime TRX40 Pro is the cheapest TRX40 motherboard on the market, coming in at just $450. And I have to say, it's not often we see ASUS providing the most affordable board. So does this mean the Prime TRX40 Pro is going to be a bad board? Well, on paper, that certainly doesn't appear to be the case. In fact, this thing looks rather good. The VRM, which we're obviously focused on for this content, looks top notch. In total, there are 16 TDA21462 60 amp power stages, Though because ASUS has opted for the ASP1405 controller, there are just eight phases. So it's one of their twin eight phase designs, a fat eight phase VRM with double the components. It's not quite as good as the VRM that we saw featured on the MSI Meg X399 creation, and that was pretty much the best X399 board from the previous generation, but the VRM on the Prime TRX40 Pro is close, which is impressive given that the X399 creation is a $700 board. So the VRM is good, but I have to say the cooling looks quite average, poor even when compared to the other TRX40 boards. There's no real finned heat sinks here and no heat pipes. All you get is a 312 gram slab of aluminium with a few thermal pads. So it'll be interesting to see just how well the Prime TRX40 Pro stacks up. Now, if you spend an extra $100 in ASUS land, that'll snag you the ROG Strix TRX40E, which when compared to the Prime gets four more USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, two and a half gigabit LAN, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.0, and Supreme FX audio. Other than that, the boards are fairly similar and they do feature the exact same VRM components. In fact, the only change here has been made to the heatsink, which now features a pair of controllable 30 millimeter fans. By default, these fans were quiet in our testing and with the 3970X, they really aren't required as far as we can tell, which makes me wonder just how much more power hungry the 3990X is going to be. Anyway, the good news for now is, although I hate how these little fans are included, they don't appear to be necessary at this point. Other than the changes to the VRM heatsink and the other features that we've already talked about, the only other difference is the design. The ROG Strix is a blackboard, whereas the Prime features a lighter white and silver color scheme. So with 16 TDA21462 60 amp power stages, I'm expecting good things from this Strix board. Now, time for ASUS's flagship TRX40 motherboard, the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme. I have to say, I kind of wish they include the chipset name in these flagship boards, but whatever, it's not a big deal. So in typical Zenith Extreme fashion, this board looks pretty incredible, but at $850, it needs to not just look incredible, but also be all around awesome. The board offers four PCIe 4.0 times 16 slots, five M.2 slots, loads of USB ports, 10 gigabit LAN, and well, the list just goes on. It also includes a beefy eight phase VRM using the ASP1405 controller connected to 16 Infineon TDA21472 70 amp power stages. So a similar configuration to the Prime TRX40 Pro and ROG Strix TRX40E, just with slightly higher rated Infineon power stages. As for the cooling, it's an evolution of what we saw from the Strix model. It's basically the same VRM heatsink with two 30 millimeter fans, but this time it features a nickel plated copper heat pipe, which connects it to a second larger heatsink, which encases the rear IO panel. 
The Zenith 2 Extreme has also been upgraded with a full-size backplate which connects to the PCB behind the Varum components using a series of thermal pads. Overall, it's a neat looking board that should perform well. Moving on, we have the Gigabyte Terex 40 Aorus Master, which comes in at $500, positioning it between the ASUS Prime Terex 40 Pro and ROG Strix Terex 40E in terms of price. On paper, this looks like a strong offering from Gigabyte. The board includes features such as 5 gigabit LAN, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.0, 4 PCIe 4.0 x 16 slots, high quality integrated audio, and like many of these high-end Terex 40 boards, the list really does just go on. As for the VRM, Gigabyte's not messing around. Here we have the new Infineon XDPE132G5C 16-phase controller, and it's configured to deliver a 16-phase V-Core VRM using 16 Infineon TDA21472 70 amp power stages. So technically this is a better setup than what ASUS is offering on their flagship $850 board. Gigabyte's also using real finned heat sinks, and there's two of them, and they aren't small. Also connected to the second heatsink is a single 30mm fan located under the plastic I.O. panel, and it's designed to draw in cool air from the rear of the case. I'm a little surprised Gigabyte needs to include active cooling for this setup, but apparently they do. The TRX40 Aorus Extreme is Gigabyte's flagship TRX40 board, and it's another $850 US beast. The board really is a beast though, whereas ASUS used the extended ATX form factor for the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme, Gigabyte's gone for the XL ATX form factor, I assume that's an abbreviation for extra large. Whatever the case though, it means you'll want a bloody big case, as this board is not only wider than normal, but it's also longer, measuring 32.5cm long by 27.5cm wide, so make sure you check your case's specs before buying. As for the VRM, you get the same 16 phase design featured on the Aorus Master, so 16 TDA 21472 amp power stages, configured as a 16 core V core VRM. The only difference here being the heat sinks. The heat sink over the VRM components is much the same, but this time it connects to a much larger finned heat sink, which again features a 30 millimeter fan. In terms of cooling, the Aorus Extreme is without question the best equipped of all the TRX40 boards. Moving on to ASRock, and first up we have their TRX40 Crater, a reasonably affordable motherboard by TRX40 standards at just $460 US. It's a pretty simple looking board really, but it does pack some impressive features. In fact, it has some really impressive features given the price. It includes 10 gigabit LAN, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5.0, 4 PCIe 4.0 times 16 slots, 3 M.2 slots, and 8 SATA ports. As for the VRM, it seems a little on the light side given what we've seen so far. What we have here is an 8 phase V-Core VRM. It's so compact that it fits between the two banks of DIMM slots. Still, it might only be an 8 phase VRM with just 8 power stages, but they are 90 amp ISL99390 power stages. That said though, the cooling is very basic. There's no real finned heat sinks here. And the heat sinks that are included aren't exactly huge. But ASRock has cut some fins into the heat sinks, which does increase the surface area. Also helping to improve cooling performance is an embedded 30mm fan. Really, it's not a great design, but given the feature set the ASRock Crater offers at what is entry-level TRX40 pricing, it seems like a decent deal. ASRock's flagship TRX40 motherboard, the Tai Chi, comes in at just $500 and that also makes it quite affordable by TRX40 standards. Like the Creator, it is still just an ATX board, so that means just three PCIe 4.0x16 slots and a rather narrow 24.4cm profile, which probably isn't big enough for a TRX40 board, but perhaps some of you will prefer the more compact ATX design. As for the VRM, the Taichi still uses the 8-phase ISL69247 controller, but this time hooked up are 16 of the 90 amp ISL99390 power stages, and with the use of 8 doublers offers 16 phases, so a pretty serious VRM on this board. In terms of cooling, the Taichi has some of the physically largest heat sinks I've ever seen on a motherboard, though they aren't nearly as impressive as what's seen on the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme model for example. Still, they should work well enough. And again, ASRock has increased the surface area of the aluminium blocks with some fins, and this time embedded on the backside are two 30mm fans. Overall, a good looking board that should perform well. 
Last up, we have the MSI Crater TRX40. And can I just say MSI, what a dumb name. They've just stolen ASRock's name. They should have stuck with Creation. What a confusing and utterly stupid move that was. The MSI Creator is also a $700 board, whereas the ASRock Creator costs just $460. So I don't get why they stole the name of a much more affordable product. A bizarre choice, that one. Anyway, stupid naming aside, the MSI Creator TRX40 is another top-notch looking board. Like Gigabyte, MSI is offering a true 16-phase V-Core VRM using the XDPE 132G 5C controller with 16 TDA21472 70 amp power stages. So the same configuration you'll find on the Gigabyte Aorus Master and Aorus Extreme. MSI is also using an almost identical finned heatsink to Gigabyte to cover their VRM components but they've connected it using a nickel plated copper heat pipe to a massive slab of aluminium that covers the IO section of the board. It really is a great looking board and MSI has thrown every feature possible at it. 10 gigabit LAN, Wi-Fi 6, nine fan headers, four PCIe 4.0 times 16 slots, 20 gigabits per second USB, three M.2 slots on board with a further four via an included PCIe expansion card. And really that is just to name a few of the features. I also really like how this board looks, but I think now it's time to put all these boards to the test. To apply load to the system, I'm using a real world blender workload, which runs for an hour, after which point I record the peak VRM temperature. Naturally, the CPU of choice is the Threadripper 3970X, which has been locked at an all core frequency of 4.2 gigahertz using 1.3 volts. And each board has been set to the highest load line calibration setting. All testing takes place in 21 degree room and we have two test configurations. The first configuration is a no direct airflow setup on an open test bench. And the second makes use of Deepcool's new Arc 90 SE. And the reason I used this case was simple. It was the only one I had available that could house the Aorus Extreme and it only just squeezes in there. Now the fan configuration in this case is a little unusual. The front fans aren't front mounted, but rather side mounted. So in the front slash side, we have three 140 millimeter fans and they're actually set as exhaust fans, while the intake fan is in the rear of the case. That's another 140 millimeter fan. So a bit of an unusual configuration there, probably wouldn't have been what I would have gone with if I had a choice. But as I said, this was the only case I had available that could fit the Aorus Extreme. To record temperatures, I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples, and I've placed multiple sensors on the surface of multiple power stages to measure the temperature across the VRM, and I'll be reporting the highest value. So this means I'll be measuring the temperature directly on top of the component between it and the thermal pad, and not an internal temperature, which is bound to be a little bit higher. Still, with the boards tested on the exact same configurations, it'll give you a clear picture on how they compare in terms of VRM thermal performance. Okay, so here's the no direct airflow test bench results and the BIOS version used for each board is labeled on the graph. Also, please note the maximum LLC setting was used for testing each board. Now, the first thing you might notice here is just how low all the temperatures are given the test conditions. Only the very best X570 boards manage these temperatures with a stock Ryzen 9 3900X. Anyway, here you can see there are no bad TRX40 boards, at least not in the bunch we've tested here, which is almost all of them. For VRM thermal performance, the MSI Crater and Gigabyte Aorus Extreme are the standouts, and I really like how the MSI board doesn't include an active fan, and yet it delivered one of the best results. That said, the fan on the Aorus Extreme barely spun up under these test conditions, and it certainly couldn't be heard. The ASUS ROG Zenith 2 Extreme was also very quiet and provided very solid performance, despite being just a few degrees warmer than the Gigabyte and MSI flagship boards. Then we have the Aorus Master and ROG Strix boards coming in at just 59 degrees, followed by the Tai Chi at 60 degrees, all a very acceptable temperatures given the test conditions. Then finally, the Prime and ASRock Crater maxed out at 61 degrees, again a very good result under these conditions. Now at the bottom of the graph, we have the Aorus Master using the F4A BIOS, which uses a GSA 1.0.0.2, and it's this very result that delayed this content by more than a week. 
For some reason, the F4A BIOS saw the master operating 11 degrees hotter than the extreme, and that just doesn't seem right given they use the same VRM, with the only difference being the secondary heatsink, which admittedly is much larger on the extreme version, but still that shouldn't account for an 11 degree difference in operating temperature. So I contacted Gigabyte, and after some back and forth, they claimed there was an issue with the F4A BIOS for the master and provided a newer T6 version. The T6 version uses a GSA 1.0.0.3, but they say the issue with the previous version had to do with the VRM fan. It wasn't spinning up fast enough. Right away, I found it hard to believe that a single 30 millimeter fan that you can't even hear could cause an 11 degree difference in temperature. Therefore, I tested the T6 BIOS with the fan completely disabled and to very little surprise, found zero difference in operating temperature for the VRM. So whatever changes Gigabyte made, they had nothing to do with the VRM fan. Moving over to testing inside the Deepcool Arc, and here we see with some airflow that the temperatures have dropped anywhere from a degree up to six degrees. It was the MSI crater that dropped a rather massive six degrees in temperature, which probably isn't all that surprising given that the board doesn't feature any form of active cooling, but it does feature real finned heat sinks. This big drop meant that the MSI crater was the best performer in the test case, peaking at just 49 degrees. And that's amazingly cool for a system that was drawing around 600 watts from the wall. The Asuth Zenith 2 Extreme came in second with a peak temperature of just 51 degrees, and that's a five degree drop from the previous test. Then we have the Aorus Extreme at 52 degrees, and it saw a three degree drop in temperature from the test bench. The ASRock boards only saw a single degree drop from the open air test bench results, and this is likely because they rely on active cooling more and don't feature any proper finned heat sinks. Well, the good news here being we didn't find any duds, which is a little unusual for these VRM thermal testing roundups. Normally there's one manufacturer that just botches their design or whatever and creates a board that either throttles or has really high operating temperatures, but all these boards ran really well. There was none that were significantly higher than the rest of the pack. And unsurprisingly, the flagship models such as the MSI Crater, the ASUS ROG Zenith 2 Extreme and the Gigabyte Aorus uh, Extreme, they all ran extremely cool. The best performers, so yeah, no surprises there. But the cheaper models such as the Prime and the ASRock Creator, they also worked really well. They were only up to about 10 degrees hotter than the flagship boards. And given how cool the flagship boards ran, certainly not an issue. Even the Aorus Master with its problematic F4A BIOS still ran at under 70 degrees, which is very cool for the VRM. I'm still not sure what the issue was there, but I'm hoping by the time you watch this, the updated BIOS will be available from Gigabyte. I have to say the MSI TRX40 crater has impressed me the most here. It was one of the coolest, if not the coolest operating board, and yet it didn't have one of those annoying 30 millimeter active fans. Still the active cooling on the ASUS and Gigabyte boards seemed pretty unnecessary. After all, the Prime only ran a few degrees hotter than the Strix and it didn't include a fan at all. Moreover, completely disabling the fan on the Aorus Master had no impact on temperatures. Perhaps these fans will be required or at least more useful with a Threadripper 3990X. Not sure on that one, but we will find out later next month. In the end, no winners or losers here. All the boards performed very well and well within spec. So I don't imagine those of you editing and encoding in your underwear up north will run into any overheating issues with any of these boards. And that is gonna do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, do all that stuff. And if you want to become more involved with Harbour Unboxed and join our awesome community, then you can jump over to our Patreon page. It's as little as $1 a month. Uh, also, we have our merch, uh, Happy Unboxing a sweater and t-shirt. They are a limited edition item that'll be available for the next week or so. So if you want one of those for Christmas, yeah, I'd, I'd hop over, links in the video description and grab one from the merch store. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.